Bom dia, bem-vindos a mais uma mesa. A gente está começando de novo os trabalhos aqui. Uh, essa mesa também é internacional, como a anterior. A gente vai fazer as apresentações em inglês, então a mediação vai ser majoritariamente em inglês. Uh, a gente tem aqui o Howard e o Pedro, que já estão com a gente. Uh, teríamos mais três apresentações, mas não vieram até agora, então nós vamos começar com os dois que já estão aqui. So, good morning, everyone. On behalf of the organizing committee of the third meeting of postgraduation studies in philosophy at UNIFEST, I would like to open the meeting by welcome all of you who are present, as well as our colleagues who will soon present their works. Uh, só para avisar, a gente já decidiu aqui a ordem da apresentação, o Howard vai ser o primeiro, Howard will be the first one to present, to, to do this presentation, and then after Pedro, e depois a gente volta para as perguntas. After the presentations, we come to the, uh, some questions, if we have some questions. So, Howard, it's your time. Uh, all right. Uh, so should I do anything with that? Oh, thank you. So um, in today's uh, presentation, I want to uh, talk about some issue related to the research in the realm of motor epistemology. And um, so previously, some theorists, especially those who endorse the Aristotelian uh, metaphysics about essence, they also have a vision that in the realm of say how we know about what is metaphysically possible or necessary we can tell a story that is similar to um finding aristotelian metaphysical picture that is we derive our knowledge of possibility and necessity from knowledge of essence and if this is the case then symmetrically it seems to suggest um, if we want to have a motor epistemology plausibly telling us what is possible or necessary, we must first have an epistemology of essence. It serves as a basis for a plausible motor epistemology. And in today's presentation, I want to suggest uh, it may not be the case. The epistemology of essence, if we take scrutiny at it, we'll find out that actually the dependency relation or the priority relation it goes in reverse. That is, modal epistemology um, serve actually as a basis for a plausible epistemology of essence. And here are just the overall view of my main argument. So first, I identify two of the most promising ways to uh, elucidate how we obtain knowledge of essence. And hereafter, I may abbreviate knowledge of essence as KE. Um, we may do it in, in probably two ways. First, rationalist road, under rationalist road. The other is abductivist road. I will kind of like us tell a little bit more detail a little bit later in the presentation. I will argue that in these two roads, if we're following them to try to get knowledge of essence, then actually we will have to rely on some previous modal knowledge. But if this is the case, then it seemingly suggests that epistemology of essence doesn't really enjoy the kind of priority of claim by those theorists. Instead, the ep epistemic priority should go in reverse. Um, but before I get into the detail of it, let me first start with a little bit of uh, elucidation of the overall background. So um, when we talk about possibility and necessity, there are many sense, right? So we may talk about, say, logical possibility, logical necessity, or we may talk about epistemic possibility or necessity. Um, and it will just mean something like, so what is compatible or say what must follows from our evidence. But here, when I talk about possibility and necessity, I'm focusing on so-called metaphysical modality. That is um, a kind of sense we are talking about possibility and necessity in an absolute and objective sense. And 
in philosophical con context, we often assert and talk as if we know something about these metaphysical modalities. I mean, say, for example, I can talk about possibilities of, say, my house being pink. And um, I mean, talking about it in a kind of like objective sense, about a kind of possible state of my house, right? And not only can it be about a mundane subject matter, it can also be about um, some more extraordinary subject matter, that is a philosophical zombie exists. So there actually can be zombies that have physical state just like ours, but just lack any conscious experience. And if we can justifiably uh, telling us, telling people that why we have this kind of knowledge, then probably it will be a very good um, reason to be against physicalism in metaphysic in philosophy of mind. But then here comes the question. So what are the basic source of knowledge of the above claims, the claim above here? And what is the limit of our reach of this kind of knowledge? And is and try to give a theory to answering these two questions are the task of modal epistemology. And there is some previous attempt, of course, let me try to consult to some um, cognitive process or some means to elucidate what might be some possible source of our knowledge of metaphysical modality. So take I'm just kind of kind of showing one of the example here. So consider some may suggest conceivability serve as a source of our um, modal justified beliefs. Say if someone say me, I can conceive a world that verifies P, then I will have a good um, source of justification to believe that P is possible. So for example, I can imagine I can conceive that the piece of paper on my hand, um, it can be on, on fire. I can have a mental image of it. If this is the case, then probably it will be a good piece of reason to suggest, well, it's metaphysically possible that the piece of paper on my hand, it actually burns. It can burn right now. But there's one immediate problem with this kind of theory, right? So it seems that like how we conceive things, it can mistakenly lead us to the scenario that only appear to verify P. So consider the following statement. Possibly transparent iron exists. So you may try to form a mental image about, say, maybe at a seminar or chemist, uh, a chemistry conference, there's a scientist holding one transparent thing and say like, oh, I just manufacture, I just create transparent iron. But seemingly, you cannot really exclude the possibility that what you're imagining are just actually some um, fraudian scenario of the scientific community. Say, like, maybe it just actually uh, like a piece of plastic, right? But like, how do we distinguish between those good from the decept deceptive conceiving cases? Seemingly, we need some further information. But if this is the case, the problem aren't solved. Right? Some may suggest there's just going to be some feature of iron you cannot imagine away. And if that is the case, then um, you will be accurately perceiving what is possible for the iron. But like seemingly, how do we know what are some, um, some essential feature of the iron? Seemingly, they need some further explanation. And this motivates the essence-based model of epistemology. So they're inspired by the finding metaphysics that suggests essence are the metaphysics source of possibility and necessity. This suggests, let's just tell a similar story with knowledge from knowledge of essence as a source of knowledge of possibility and necessity. So the overall picture of a essence-based model of epistemology may look like very much like something like this. So water is, so first I have a knowledge about water essence, that is, it is essentially H2O. And by knowing certain conceptual link between 
essential property and necessary property, then I can derive knowledge of necessity. And then for knowledge of possibility, what I need to know is just what is compatible with water's essence and necessity. And here, I think I will not take issue with the two components of essence-based model epistemology with the bridge principle here. I would say like it probably is a kind of conceptual truth. But I think with the epistemology of essence, say how we know what is essential for some entity or some kind of entity, it deserves some scrutiny. So I think the question immediately rises here is what are the means for us to obtain knowledge of essence? And here I summarize, I subsume, and I think probably just, just the most, the two most promising ways to know what is the essence of something. So first, we may go, go, we may obtain it by a rationalist route. Say so we have certain rational capacity and we just obtain knowledge of essence via a a priori fashion. The, the other is we go through a abductive or inference to best explanation route. And I think one immediate question raised again is that does these two roads, they can plausibly elucidate how knowledge of essence as a basis for modal knowledge. I'm gonna kind of try to argue that the answer is no. And then this go into the main part of my argument. Say, I will try to argue that in a rationalist road, either, our pre either we still need some previous modal knowledge or knowledge of essence is actually dispensable in some other cases. And on the other hand, if we take the abductivist road, we will still need previous modal knowledge to obtain knowledge of essence. But if this is the case, then seemingly the priority between epistemology of essence and modal epistemology will go in reverse. Since knowledge of essence will still depend on some previous model knowledge. And now let's look at the rationalist road first. So um, one dominant figure that suggests we should conceive how we obtain knowledge of essence um, is a priori or in a rationalist fashion are uh, E.J. Law. And he suggests this is a kind of a priori access of grasping the essence of an entity. I mean, unfortunately, Low never really made clear, say, what kind of faculty does he mean by grasping? And Taku, uh, some later theorists may just suggest, just take it as a rational access. But just uh, for the sake or to facilitate the discussion, I would just temporarily, I just temporarily assume that rational access as a kind of intuition-like or non-inferential rational capacity here. And to facilitate the discussion, I will further distinguish the, the case I'm gonna discuss as complex and easy cases. So with the complex cases are the cases that may not be so straightforward whether the claim are essentially true. An easy case, maybe it will be more straightforward. It's a kind of like an easy subject. Now, let's first consider um, what is the essence of a ellipse or what might be more likely to be the essence of an ellipse. So Low suggests, so Low asks us to consider E1 and E2. An ellipse is a locus of a point moving continuously in a plane in such a fashion that the sum of the distance between it and two other fixed points remain constant. And E2, ellipse is the closed curve of intersection between a coin and, and the plane cutting at an oblique angle to its axis greater than the coin side. Low suggests, well, E1 it describes the essence of the, of the ellipse, E2 just describes a merely necessary true of ellipse. And we know this in an a priori fashion. But here I want to ask, does this so straightforward and so intuitive that E1 is essential true, but E2 is just merely necessary for ellipse? 
I would say probably it's not the case. But here Lowe says something quite interesting about the case above. He suggests, well, we know that E1 is um, essential truth, but E2 just merely necessary because we know something about ellipse can exist perfectly without a cone. But here, I think, here now, Low is actually providing an example that actually, before I know what is the essence or not, I first know, well, it's just possible that ellipse can exist without a cone. And here, right now, I may, I may not have some clear idea of what the essence of something is, right? But like here, knowledge of possibility already help us to exclude E2 as not as essential truth, but as something that is merely um, necessary. But knowledge of possibility of ellipse here, seemingly it's kind of, we can grasp it more straightforwardly than other kind of essential truth. I think this kind of uh, very nicely describe how we actually know what is the essence of something in an a priori fashion. That is, actually, first, we know it through a kind of bootstrapping process. That is, we exclude some property, and, and then we eventually finding out what is finally the essence of something. But if this is so, it seems that we, we cannot understand what is the essence of something in a kind of vacuum way. We first understand some previous modal knowledge. And this modal knowledge, same knowledge about possibility or necessity, it's actually more easy to obtain, more straightforwardly obtainable than essence of essential truth itself. So in a kind of complex cases, how we justify and select what claims are essential truth cannot come in vacuum, but requires some previous modal knowledge. Some of you now may object that, but in some easy cases, seemingly we can directly obtain knowledge of essence and derive modal knowledge subsequently. But say, for example, say I may consider, say, a set of Mercury, Mars, and Moon, and I can intuit that essentially Mercury is a member of the set and then derive necessarily Mercury is the member of the set. But however, this is not the path that we must take on, right? So consider um, when we are asked to intuit what is necessary for the set here, um, it's seemingly more psycho psychologically realistic to just, or practically realistic to just directly intuit that necessarily Mercury is member of the set. So, but if this is the case, the importance of knowledge of essence as a basis of modal knowledge, it will actually drop out of the picture. And given consideration above, and seemingly in the case of intuition, knowledge of essence is more just like a special case of modal knowledge. But here's a kind of like a more better picture. Just actually, we can just consider both case of knowledge of essence and modal knowledge just by discussing, say, modal intuition overall, whether it is reliable in general or not. And at least lead, lead me to my first part of the conclusion. For complex case, knowledge of essence require previous modal knowledge. Or for easy cases, knowledge of essence is actually dispensable. Now, what about abductive cases? Here I borrow some discussion from Antonella Maluzzi. She suggests that she considers, say, essence of concrete uh, like uh, natural kinds. Um, the essence of a natural kind are just a property that bears special explan explanation power. And she considers it kind of like a common cause that hold to explain, say, a, a kind, whether it can has um, this or that multiple um, different other features. And he take silver as a kind of example. So say like, uh, consider silver. Say we know a lot of empirical properties about silver, about say its autonomic number, um, say 
about its malleability, about its how it conducts electricity, etc. And Malozzi suggests what is the essence of the silver are going to be the property that serve as that serve best explanatory power to explain all the rest of the physical or chemical behavior. Say again, melting point, boiling point, electrical, thermal conductivity, etc. And now, um, Malozzi surprisingly doesn't really. I mean, his her paper are entitled of say uh, of like solving certain model etymology problem, but like then she didn't really provide spelling out what exactly how we understand knowledge, how we have it, knowledge of explanatory properties. I think the overall epistemology picture are something like this, or something like say we have, we first have a set of property of a kind, and then via a a priori, sorry, via a inference to the best explanation process, we may evaluate say each property's explanatory power, etc. Then we may pin down what are the properties with a special explanatory power. But if this is how the abductive road um, work to derive knowledge of essence, does it properly describe how knowledge of essence serve as a basis for modal knowledge? I think it can hardly be the case. How so? I think here we'll be consider again how I select knowledge property with explanatory power. Partially, I exclude those do not constantly present observation. Say maybe the social value of silver when I'm considering essence of the silver. But if if I'm doing something like this, then I'm actually introducing knowledge of contingency or knowledge of possibilities in my abductive process to help me to、um, exclude some of the properties that are not. Should not be considered as the candidate of essence. But if this is the case, then again, the dependency between knowledge of essence and modal knowledge it comes in reverse. And I think the discussion above we can actually、uh, think of other cases、um, about natural kinds, and we can multiply them. So this leads again to the conclusion of my main argument. Once I try to spell out the epistemology of essence in detail about how we know knowledge of essence, we find out that it may actually be dispensable to know modal knowledge, or we may already need some modal knowledge. But if this is the case, then epistemology of essence doesn't enjoy priority over modal epistemology. Instead, epistemic priority of inquiry should go in reverse. To reach a plausible epistemology of essence, we need some plausible modal epistemology first. So, this then come to the final general lesson is that epistemology of essence it depend on a plausible modal epistemology, and、um, just some other ways to describe the new kind of relation between epistemology of essence now is that you may consider it as a non basic parser. Or a non-basic special case of modal epistemology, but it doesn't really serve as a basis. And just one final clarification is that I'm not against the metaphysical picture of our Sotilian essentialist. But what I'm trying to argue is even if metaphysically essence is indeed the metaphysical source of possibility and necessity, epistemologically the kind of picture may be. I'm、um, going backward in reverse, and here is kind of like all of my presentation. I hope I'm still on time, and thank you all for your attention. Then, Howard, I thank you for your presentation. It's so interesting. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you to present yourself. I forgot to introduce yourself in the beginning, so please tell us where are you doing、oh, your sorry. searches and everything. 
Um, I'm a I'm a PhD student at the University of Miami, Florida. Yeah, I'm my fourth year. So nice. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, now it's your time, Pedro. I will put you here in your slides. It's this one, right? Yeah. Me, yeah. I. Here. You... Okay, I can interact with the slides here. Yes, yes. Okay. okay, so I'm a PhD student at Unicamp. Uh, I'm in my fourth year as well. I'm studying under Walter Carnielli. I guess people know him. Uh, well, I'm going to talk to you guys uh, I've changed the, the title of the of the paper I'm writing with Professor Carnielli a lot. So uh, this title is al already gone because this presentation is somewhat old. It has a month or so. Uh, a lot of things have changed. So I, well, now I'm, I'm tr more or less conceptualizing this somewhat differently, but I'll use this presentation mostly for the abstract so you guys can have some some kind of visual aid uh, while I, was, I speak. Uh, I'll mostly do the presentation verbally so because there's a lot of math in the slides and I think this is sometimes more confusing than explanatory for some people and I think I can can explain the the essence of the problem I'm, I'm going to address uh, in simple terms. Although dealing with the problem is not so simple, but explaining it, I think it's it can be done verbally. So here's the, the idea. Sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, just so you guys know, uh, I work with uh, uh, something uh, which is called social choice theory. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but uh, social choice theory uh, is famous for uh, so-called arrow impossibility theorem, which is a mathematical theorem uh, which shows that essentially uh, you can't have a kind of... Uh, voting system which satisfies all of a certain set of uh, minimal democratic properties uh, which means well that you can have uh, if you want to have some uh, some of the virtues of a democratic process uh, some of them you have to give up some other uh, properties okay so it's kind of a, an area that produces a lot of puzzles like this. Okay, so here's the idea. Uh, I study this area and I'm trying to use the techniques from social choice theory in to deal with different problems, problems that are not necessarily related to social problems. Okay, uh, and the problem I'm going to address here is the problem of, well, I, as I said, I have conceptualized it uh, in a lot of different ways, uh, but you can think of it as the problem of personal identity or, uh, as I have, have been conceptualizing it lately, the problem of the true self. So here's the idea. Uh, well, we all have some kind of, uh, I guess, some kind of drive to to know who we are in the sense that well i guess we all are a little concerned about our personal identities okay but the question is how do we know who we are it seems like a fair question right well what kind of evidence do we should we consider in this question what should we take into account to answer this question? Well, 
uh, it seems, according to some nice studies, nice recent studies in psychology, experimental psychology, that at least as far as uh, folk psychology is concerned, people tend to have this idea that we all have some kind of true self or, or essential self, as you may put it. Okay, so this seems to be a kind of universal idea, universal in the sense that, well, it seems to, to happen in some form or another in every culture, okay, and it is uh, culturally stable uh, in the sense that, well, people of different backgrounds have more or less the same idea of what a true self should be, okay? Uh, and it's, it's kind of a robust idea uh, in the sense that it's uh, actor-observer invariant, which means that, well, people tend to, to evaluate their true selves in the same terms as they evaluate the true selves of other people, okay? So it seems like a, a good uh, starting point for the question of who we are. Uh, it seems we, we tend to conceptualize the, it in these terms of the true self, okay? So the problem is that, well, according to experimental psychology, this very conception of a true self uh, is somewhat uh, evidence-insensitive in the sense that, well, people tend to think of our true selves as... Uh, well, majorly uh, positive. So people will ascribe to, to other people uh, true selves that are essentially good. That's the idea. Even if uh, those, those, per those people have no, have, have given no sign of being good at all. So the, the experiment shows that people are willing to to ascribe goodness even to psychopaths as, as part of their true selves, okay? So it seems this concept, this uh, popular concept uh, is kind of, well, it seems we are concerned of, with true selves, but our, our folk psychology notion of the true self is kind of bogus. So the question I'm, I, I will address is this. Well, can we get, uh, let's say, a rational reconstruction of this notion? One that fits the, the bill of being somewhat rational. Well, uh, so the idea of how I address this question is this. Okay, and this is where the social choice theory part comes. Uh, Social choice theory deals with a kind of structures that, uh, mathematical structures from the formal point of view, which we can uh, call, it's called aggregation procedures. Which is, what is an aggregation procedure? The simplest example of an aggregation procedure is precisely a voting procedure. So uh, you guys are used to voting procedures, right? Uh, well, what do you guys do when you vote? Well, given a society with a lot of voters, okay, uh, each voter will uh, cast a ballot. He or she will present uh, one of the candidates as being their choice, okay? So, uh, basically, we think of then, we then think of, well, uh, the result of a voting procedure will be what? It will be a list of candidates, okay? Each individual will uh, assign a candidate as their choice. And the election will have as result a certain candidate. That candidate will be uh, chosen. It will be the social choice, hence the name of the, the area, okay? Uh, so that's the idea of how a uh, aggregation procedure works. 
you have a list of objects, meaning you have uh, the candidate in which each person votes. That's the list. And you choose an object from the list, which will be, in a sense, representative of that list. Okay, so in the case of majority rule, which is how we essentially vote in democracy, well, the candidate which has the most votes will be ascribed as the, the one which is uh, representative of that society, of the choice of that society. Okay? So the idea here that, that I'm applying to the problem of the true self is this. Well, through time, people, we know people change through time, right? So we can consider, well, at a certain time, a, certain, a person is, uh, she, he or she has some properties, right? At a different time, she will have different properties or properties change. That's what change is all about in time. So the idea is, well, if we consider, let's say, the time slices of time parts of a person, we will find that that person has different properties at each time slice. And we will try to find, basically, uh, uh, a kind of uh, object of the same nature, a person, uh, which is, in a sense, representative of uh, who that person has been throughout, throughout time. So we can think of the, the time slices, the time slices as the voters, right? The analogy is this. So each time slice will contribute a certain property, a certain set of properties, and well, the, the result in the aggregate person will have to be representative of the properties that uh, that person has have has had throughout life. That's the idea. So you, you, we are essentially uh, uh, dealing with uh, problems. That's the idea of, with problems of essence in terms of uh, the same kind of structure that we find in, in voting procedures, right? That's the, the intuition, the analogy. So what kind of properties should we consider as relevant in the case of uh, selves? Well, it seems that according to psychology, our values, uh, the, the research points out, our values, and especially our moral values, seem to be what people uh, recognize as more central to their uh, their selves. Okay, so this is fitting because well, uh, social choice theory has a very neat way of representing values. Uh, in social choice theory, we we represent values in terms of uh, rankings, rankings of goodness. So the basic idea is, well, what is a ranking? It's simply, well, you order, a ranking is an ordering of a certain set of objects in terms of better and worse. So you say in an election, well, this candidate is better than this candidate and etc. Okay, so you are simply ordering uh, the candidates. Okay, we can represent values in the moral sense like this. Well, this kind, this state of affairs is better than this. What this another another state of affairs in terms of what I consider morally good. Okay, so you have uh, you have the idea of a ranking uh, in social choice theory. We refer to this kind of rankings generally as preferences but the word somewhat misleading in some contexts. Okay, so we have a representation of values. Okay, that's the idea. So we may think, well, uh, we know people's values change throughout life. They, they may vary throughout life. So we will consider at each, uh, let's say, time slice of the person, uh, we may be neutral about well, what time slices should we consider this is not uh, uh, the main question 
uh, depending on what you think is the, the relevant, uh, let's say, the relevant cut here. But we can consider, well, a person can be represented, uh, the variations in a person can be re represented like this then. Uh, each time slice will have a certain uh, set of values, okay, in terms of rankings of better and worse. That's the idea. So we are trying to find, well, what ranking of better and worse, what preference, what values represents who, who that person has been throughout life. That's the, we have reformulated the question of the, what is the, a person's true self in terms of an aggregation procedure then. That's the, the formal idea. Well, the, the question is, uh, how this, uh, this procedure should respond to the evidence provided by the time slices? Well, there are some very obvious intuitions in this sense. One of them is this. Well, if a person has always, always judged a certain uh, state of affairs better than another, for instance, let's say the person has always judged X is strictly better than Y, okay, throughout her whole life. Well, it seems plausible that we should ascribe that preference or that value to her true self, right? I mean, her preference has never varied varied throughout life, so we may think, well, that's her true preference, okay? Another uh, uh, property this, this procedure should satisfy, it seems to me, which is intuitive, is this. Well, we shouldn't ascribe a value to a person that she, she has never held in her life, okay? So if she has never preferred X to Y, there's no sense in saying that her true self prefers X to Y. This, this idea would block the, the point of the, the psychopath, right? So, well, it's unreasonable to ascribe to a person a value that that person has never held in her life, okay? So the problem is, okay, this seems intuitive, but this is simply too weak. Weak in the sense that well, we are not considering the possibility of variation in this context so far. So the problem that I found in, in my work is that when you try to consider variation, even very slight variation, you get to, to a problem, basically a paradox, which is this. And I will describe, try to describe very succinctly the paradox. Well, First of all, it seems that uh, from a psychological point of view, people think that uh, everybody has a true self. Everybody has an essential self. So this is uh, a property that our aggregation procedure should have. It should ascribe a true, a true self to every person possible. It doesn't matter what are the person's preferences throughout life our procedure should have a response about who that person has been or who is that person's true self, right? Okay, this is the first property. The second property, which I think is reasonable, is this. Well, uh, the person we must say that that, true, that person has truly been in her life must be someone that that person has been at least... Uh, in some moment uh, has actually been. I think it's not reasonable, at least from a, let's say, a realist point of view, that we should ascribe uh, as being the true self of a person, someone that that person has never been in her entire life, in any moment in that her entire life. So the idea is, well, uh, essentially, well, uh, or other selves or other time slices must be deviations from our true self. That's the intuition, okay? Uh, so variation means deviation from uh, who we truly are. So who we truly are must be someone that we have been at least in some moment in our life. And the other point is, uh, which is kind of an idea of an average. 
which is this. Well, if you have uh, always thought that, for instance, X is at least as good as Y throughout your whole life, and uh, sometimes in your life you have thought that X is strictly better than Y, that means, well, sometimes, mo maybe most of the time, but sometimes you are indifferent between X and Y, and sometimes you think that X is better than Y. Okay, so you have, through your whole life, you have thought that, well, uh, drinking coffee is at least as good as drinking tea, for example, but, well, most of the time, or sometimes at least, you have thought that drinking coffee is actually better than drinking tea. So it seems reasonable that we should think, well, then your true preference in life is actually for coffee instead of tea. Okay, so on average, let's say, you have preferred coffee to tea. That's the idea. This seems to me also a reasonable, intuitive idea of how to, to find what is uh, the true preference or the true value of a person. Well, it turns out, I won't go through the mathematical details, but it turns out that, well, these, these, these three conditions, which I have called uh, the universality condition, the strong actuality condition, and the other, the, it already exists in the, in the literature in social choice theory and other contexts, which is called the strong Pareto condition. Well, those three conditions, they are inconsistent. They are logically inconsistent in the sense that there will be some, uh, some people, some configurations of preference throughout a, a person's life or some, some ways in which a person's va uh, values may vary throughout life uh, that uh, consists in counterexamples to these three conditions. So that, that's why they are logically inconsistent. You can't have uh, those two conditions uh, that uh, the preference of, a, of the true self of a person is an average of her uh, preference throughout life, and that's... Uh, her true self is an actual self, at least in some moment of their life. If you as assume these two conditions, then there will be some persons about whom it's impossible to construct a procedure satisfying these two conditions. That's the theorem. You can't have th the three things. You must abandon at least one of them. Well, the problem then is, well, which one should you abandon? Well, let me talk very briefly of the consequences of abandoning one of the conditions. If you, each one of the conditions. If you ab abandon the idea of actuality, then you must commit to the idea that a person, the true self of a person may be a completely virtual one. So if you abandon the idea of actuality, you must commit to some kind of, well, notion that uh, there are mere possibilia. There are some objects which are merely, po merely possible, they, are, they aren't actual, and moreover, that some people are, what they truly are, is something that is merely possible. So they are, in a sense, identical with merely possible things in terms of personal identity. Okay? This seems like a tough bullet to bite in terms of metaphysics. Well, without going through the details, if you abandon the, the idea of an average, then what will happen? Well, then you basically need some extra information about uh, a, uh, a person to ascribe a true self to her, which won't be in terms of their values strictly. So the idea, the idea here is that, well, to, uh, to say who a person truly is, you will, have, you will need some information which is extrinsic to that person, okay? So uh, the context in which a person lives may make her true self vary, which is also kind of problematic, okay? So you have to ascribe essences in terms of extrinsic properties. 
And the third possibility is simply abandoning the idea of universality. So there will be some per some people who don't have a either don't have a true self, or uh, you have to think that well they are not the exactly they are not the same person throughout her their whole lives. In some parts of their lives, they are one person, her true self will be one, and in another part of her life, her true self will be another. So those persons are split. That's the the usual problem of the fission in the the, uh, the personal identity literature. Well, that person will undergo fission throughout their, their lives. Those people will undergo fission throughout their lives. That's the problem. That's the puzzle. You have a kind of a trilemma there. Okay, so that's basically the idea. That was what I had to present to you guys today. Thank you for the attention. And I guess we'll now go to the, the questions. I have one in the chat already. So should I proceed to, to answer it or? <laughs> Pedro, thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah, I think it it, it came while you were speech, uh, while you were talking. So I presume it's for you, right? Okay. <laughs> I yeah. will put it here. You are gonna answer in English. Yeah. So I, I will mean... translate. I will translate. So Howard can also uh, know the question oh, it's is really your question actually. <laughs> What? Or no, it's not you? mine. It came no, from, it's from, from the chat ah, okay. here. Okay. Can you see? So, ah, okay. uh -huh. yeah. So the question is, there is experience, relationship in the world for the purpose of survival and living. Values, is, values are convenient, but does one adhere to them essentially? Okay, that's a... Uh, that's an... A complex question. I think it's more a question for, uh, I guess, for experimental psychology than for philosophy. Although I'm basing my work in uh, data which comes from experimental psychology, I guess this is a question for experimental psychology. Personally, uh, I think uh, people don't actually adhere to their to their values uh, so intrinsically as the idea of uh, essence would require. And this is actually the problem. I mean, uh, the, the experimental psychology seems to point uh, to the following fact, okay? Uh, we tend to think of our moral values as central to our uh, personal identities, but what is puzzling about this, according to experimental psychology, is that the values which we tend to consider uh, more funda fundamental, the core of our personal identities, are precisely uh, the values that are socially more shared, which are widely shared. Okay? So I, I think this is paradoxical because, in well, for one, uh, on one hand, it seems well, what should be explanatory of what is our identities should be precisely what individual, individualizes us the most. Okay? So, but the problem is, well, what people seem to tend to consider uh, central to their personal, personal identities is precisely the values which are more shared. So, which we, which those values which individualizes them the least. So this seems paradoxical, right? At least to me, this seems very paradoxical. Okay, so that's the problem, I guess. Uh, why people, it seems, people tend to think of moral values and especially socially shared moral values as central. Well, it seems it's precisely those that, those values which vary the least throughout life because they are social shared. You have a social pressure for them not to vary. Okay, you have a social pressure to maintain those values as your own values. So they are substantially more uh, concrete. They are more stable than your other values. So it's uh, people in the, the research, uh, uh, moral values that are controversial, like for instance, should you defend or not, should you accept or not abortion? They don't consider those values uh, 
as relevant for their personal identities in general. Okay, when you that's an important pro point when you talk about their true selves, because when you talk about their selves more generally, depending on how you put the question, if you put the question about their true selves, they will ask you those values as not so relevant. But when you all ask about their selves generally, they may consider them relevant. So there's a, a framing problem there also. That's a that's an interesting data. But well, uh, I can point out to the research if you guys want to to read about it. But that's psychology, not so much philosophy. Okay, understand. So you guys, do you have any questions to each other? Howard, Pedro. Yeah, I, I'll let Howard ask first if he has Sorry. a question. Okay. Um, so, um, so uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, topic to to think about, and and um, I don't know. I kind of uh, so so I kind of see like how how you may try to kind of tackle both probably conceptual and also uh, metaphysical side of of the issue about true self and. And um, this kind of then linked it, and the, the way that you present it kind of linked it. Uh, so, so first is about say, uh, you kind of talk a lot about the the idea of value, but I wonder say, what about say the the things, the the element of say maybe subjectivity? Does it also play a role in in your um consideration of what is true self or are you kind of like more social value oriented and the second part is kind of just a just a kind of feedback about i am thinking about um some literature about conceptual engineering so so it's about say um so it's about say discussing about say what kind of concept ought we have right and and then I also think about the, the some work by uh, Amy Thomason on ontology. So he, she kind of hold a Carnapian and pragmatic view about about ontology. So it's not like say for self for stuff property. It's not like a half like a happy way stuff. It's a kind of something that you can you can individualize it or you can discuss. Maybe it's modal property. Maybe it's essential property in a kind of pragmatic way. And I think if say you maybe just a, just a kind of raising some possibility about say, maybe it will be possible to go in a, a very pragmatic way to think about, about um, in a very pragmatic way to think about what self is. Maybe um, I, I think it kind of launched both well with connect well with your um, your account and also you can actually provide a very lightweight but but um, but coherent way of understanding what self is just uh, throwing out some random thoughts so there's like uh, just oh, I, I, so just the the one question I, I the first question, random, but... yeah so the first question okay, is just so about the... say what about subjectivity I mean I kind of think of the personal identity in a kind of a very mm -hmm probably old-fashioned way so yeah oh okay so uh well also according to the research it seems we 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 don't only as only ascribe uh values to our true selves we ascribe a lot of things like uh mainly uh, it seems uh our memory seems to be relevant in people's descriptions of true selves okay desires not only uh, values. Uh, I've focused on values for two reasons, two main reasons. One is that, well, the research clearly points out to the idea that values are core to the idea of true self, in the sense that uh, people, uh, we, they, in, in experiments, they will say that, uh, well, a person has changed the most when their their moral values change okay so uh, the main kind of experiment in this sense is when people 
mainly this when people uh, undergo some kind of mental diseases like uh, Alzheimer's and things like that. And well, when they lose some part of their memories, but people still think of them as the same person. But when their, their, their moral values start to change, well, people have a difficult time in recognizing them as the same person they were before. So it seems uh, values, moral values in particular, are core to the idea of the self, okay, according to research. Uh, the second reason I focused on values is mainly because, well, the techniques of social choice theory are particularly adequate for dealing with values. <laughs> so this was kind of a technical decision. Well, there are some uh, there are some extensions of social choice theory, aggregation theory. More generally, this has been discussed. So uh, you can think of aggregation of things like predicates and other notions like this. So uh, you could, in principle, discuss, uh, for instance, you, sh you don't have necessarily to focus on, on persons. You can think of uh, the problem of how any object, in principle, vary through time uh, in this kind of terms I've been, I've been putting it here. But, well, it the, the techniques that are already very well developed in the literature work best for for personal identity ah. for this problem so it's easier to focus on this problem than any other problem that's the point here actually ah, okay okay gotcha. so yeah. that's why i focus in this problem uh but you, yeah uh if we, if you'd like a a better uh uh let's say a better treatment of the idea of true selves, you should, I think, you should uh, open up to, to other properties, not only to, to values. But I think, personally, and I'd argue that, well, in a sense, preferences, not only values, but preferences more generally, rankings of goodness, they seem to me, from a subjective point of view, uh, more intrinsic to a person than other properties. Okay. So I personally would argue that, well, if we're talking about true selves in terms of essences, maybe we should focus on those more subjective aspects. But that's a, a whole other discussion. Yeah, true. <laughs> I mean, it will be, yeah. it will be, uh, I think it will be something that cannot be addressed within this 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I'd like to ask you some questions, but I think the the other participant has come in. So yeah, Joel guess... just arrived here, <laughs> oh, so yeah. I want I want to welcome him here. But I think uh, you can ask your question first, and then we give the time to Joel. So let it, let me put him here. So this is Joel. Welcome, Joel. Hi. Uh, so first of all, Pedro, uh, you can ask your question to Howard, and then okay. after this, uh, Joel will have his time. Okay. Okay. So Howard, well, it's actually hard to ask a question because I mainly agree with your whole point. So <laughs> I'm I'm very convinced about your argument, Thank but you. yeah, I think it's it's. Well, I, I I don't think we, you can actually think of essences uh, before uh, any model concept of possibility. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, I'd like I'd like to ask you about the idea of explanatory power. Uh, it it seems to me that well, at least as I've as grasped from what you have said that. Uh, Explanatory power should play a, a role in defining what is what do you think is essential, right? I mean, at least in one of the perspectives you you've, you have presented. But I, I'd guess I'd, I'd think in both of them, uh, explanatory power is what is at stake in the sense, even in the rationalist point of view. I mean, uh, when you think of well, uh, 
why you should focus on the, the two-dimensional uh, definition of the ellipses? Well, it's mainly because that is a, it's a, an explanation which uh, involves less concepts. In the sense that, well, you don't have to, to have a, a theory of uh, three-dimensional space. You can have only a, a theory of uh, two-dimensional space and etc. So uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you if you had thought about this particular question. I mean, uh, if, you, if you can uh, use this to, to provide a, a criterion for essences. Yeah, um, so I, I think you raise a very um, good point about about the case for abstract as a, or ge geometry object. Yeah, um, this is the, the part that um, I also kind of think about putting into the into the presentation, but it just kind of a um, kind of just partially. I, I kind of like worry about about the the time limit that the given the time limit that I have. So so I kind of not deciding not to talk about it and in the end and I think you're right about say with geometry object with mathematical abstracta um, actually we can we can also evaluate say what properties are essential in terms of explanatory power say like we can say that it is because the the two-dimensional ellipse has the kind of property of such and such so then um you cut a cone in certain degree so you have it lips you can you can kind of kind of talk about things in this way yeah and and i think there's a debate but like uh then this is a kind of like controversial part about about explanatory power so like some may suggest when we talk about evaluating what has a more explanatory power than others it's kind of a abductive process but like uh, with a mathematic object, I think there's a debate about um, whether, say, uh, is it whether it is legitimate to uh, use, say, abductive reasoning on mathematical object, or some may suggest it just actually just overall still a priori reason, right? But like, I think if you allowing us to um, making abductive reasoning with a uh, with abstract uh, um, about what is its essential property by looking at by looking at what property has the most explanatory power of the other property of the geometry object, then actually yes, I would say, yeah, you can also consider or ranking the explanatory power to find out what is the essential property of an abstract. I think again here is that to understand what is the property has the most explanatory uh, power, then again, I think you should at least have some previous information about, say, um, what is, say, maybe, say, ellipse is my favorite shape. But like you were just excluding that as essential, personally. Well, like it just Howard may just like circle tomorrow and maybe it's not my essential true self <laughs> right and and we kind of already have some idea of what is contingent what is uh, just merely possible um property of abstracta so we can kind of go on a selection process of abduction yeah but like I think I think like uh, what you point out is just really. I'm actually have a, like a section about abduction reasoning on abstract in my following paper. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Howard. So, may, may I just point out uh, something to Howard? That, that's why I asked the question. Actually, uh, it's because well, this is actually I, I asked this question because it has something to do with uh what i study uh which is well i have mentioned arrows in possibility theorem and there are some people who argue that well you can use uh arrows in possibility theorem in epistemology as well okay 
and it would be then uh, resulting in, in terms of, uh, well, that you, when you, precisely when you are thinking of uh, abductive reasoning, when uh, inference for the best explanation, uh, well, you have a, the idea of, well, what is the best explanation? Okay. So, uh, well, there is the best explanation some, uh, in terms of simplicity. Some theories are simpler than others. Well, there are some other theories who are more consistent than others. And you have a lot of ep epistemic values. And the problem is a problem of aggregation, precisely. You have to find, well, a ranking which considers uh, among different ways of ranking theories in terms of better and worse. Okay. Uh, well, and the upshot of Eros theorem is that, well, you need to have a, what is called in the literature a dictator, which means you have to choose one of the values as the most relevant. So in, in trying to, that's the point, in trying to explain this in terms of, uh, of uh, explanatory power, you have a, a second order decision to make about, well, what value should count as more explanatory? And you kind of, well, we reproduce the original problem in the second order uh, level. You have to choose one of the values. So th th that's the problem I have with the idea of explanatory power. And that's why I, I'd like to, to hear about, uh, I'd like to hear about this, which uh, this, uh, there is a choice to be made in terms of what, basically what value is essentially more relevant for explanatory power. So you have the problem of essence in the second order question, basically. Ah, yeah, That's yeah. And um, I, I, I would say, um, I would say, yes, I mean, it, indeed, it, it with the, say, choosing theoretical or absolute uh, virtue, it eventually kind of uh, boil down to um, choosing or selecting or ranking what is the the water, like some virtue, should be prioritized, and I mean here, and I, I mean here, like then I would say, like your research definitely uh, may shed light on like how we may want to select here, and and um, here just uh, it just kind of remind me, there's one paper by a grand priest, kind of like talking about selecting. I mean, it's about actually about selecting the logical theory, a theory of logic, and it kind of a uh, Trying to introduce a ranking system in it, and and um, and kind of just like uh, just kind of pop into my mind. I want to share with you. And thanks for the for the feed, feedback. It's just awesome. Yeah, I think uh, I've enjoyed uh, your research a lot. Actually, uh, maybe we can get in contact later. <laughs> yeah, of course. That's nice. <laughs> We like when it happens. <laughs> so we are gonna hear Joel right now. So Joel, welcome. I will leave you here alone so you can do your speech. And later, if someone has any question to you, uh, we can make a conversation as well. Okay. Please introduce yourself first. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, uh, you know, in this conference, um, I'm honored. Um, so my name is Joel Alvarez, as um, it was already mentioned. Um, I'm from the University of South Florida, um, and I will be presenting on Native American epistemology. Um, I unfortunately don't have a PowerPoint, so I'll be reading um, my paper. Um, so bear with me. Um, so uh, do I start right away or? Um, I'm assuming yes. Okay, so here I go. So uh, Native Americans argue that the experience one has in dreams are real and are a source of knowledge of the real world. In addition, dreams for Native Americans are a source of epistemology as well as a source of obtaining one's identity. Gregory Cajete, an American Indian thought, notes that dreams and visions are a natural means for assessing knowledge and establishing relationships to the world. They are, encouraged, they are encouraged and facilitated. In other words, it is through dreams that individuals are guided, destined, and informed. 
Therefore, dreams, as understood by some Native Americans, are an extension of reality that anticipate events that will happen or can happen. The focus of this paper is an exploration of the philosophical and religious epistemology pertaining to Native Americans as described in their accounts of dreams. So now we will dive into the first part, which is Native American dream vision and legends. So for some Native Americans, phenomena or experiences, experiences in dreams or visions are real. And the knowledge someone obtains in dreams can assist them when they are awake. For example, the value of dreams in apparent in Western Native American traditions called the vision quest. On the outset, a vision quest is a cultural practice that many Native Amer Americans follow. And when successful, the individual gains power, guidance, protection, understanding, and knowledge from the spirit. For example, Shea Welsh and dance uh, performance knowledge states, the vision quest is an own mechanism through which to gain insight into intuitive knowledge through bodily practice. But it's also bodily practice through which access to blood memory, more specifically, might be gained. Most times vision quests are an individual journey towards deeper meaning and knowledge of the world and oneself through an extended testing of the body and exposed natural condition. In some instances, these quests can be taken on in the confines of Sweet Lodge alone in community and or in the presence of medicine person. But in all cases, the embodied practice is to deprive the body of nourishment and expose it to extreme condition in order to turn in towards the inscape to tap into the knowledge that lives there. So the quest is extremely important for many Native Americans tribes since the vision provides individuals enlightenment and guidance. Visions or dreams are a way of closing the gap between our internal connection to the energy of the universe and, uh, and our more explicit no knowing and understanding of the world. But more importantly, visions or dreams are for many, many Native Americans a primary source of revealed knowledge where the individual obtains knowledge of what they should do in the real world. David Martinez cites a couple of examples of the vision quest, notably from the Dunaza tribe and Ojibwa tribe. In these cases, the visions and dreams guide the individual in the life journey. From a young age, the children are instructed to, to fast so they can obtain dreams and visions. For instance, the Dunaza tribe believe that when a child reaches a certain age, they are ready to begin their vision quest journey. In particular, what the child pursues in their vision quest is a song that is given by an animal spirit. David Martinez describing the practice states, what the Dunaza boy will be seeking in particular during his vision quest is a Mayan, which is an animal song, itself modeled, modeled after the songs that are the cries of giant prototypical animals represented in myth. In order to acquire this song, the boy will have to travel away from camp into the bush Going into the bush and then on the vision quest means joining the world of animals. If the boy can fend off his apprehensions and maintain the fast as part of his quest, the boy will enter transformation when he is just like drunk or in a dreamlike state. At this point, the meeting between an animal and the vision seeker will be one in which the boy will understand the animal speech during this time, which, will, which may seem to be for days or even weeks. The animal who vision is who visits a vision seeker will apart in the song. So during this quest, the child seeks the song because, because it is believed that it provides them with information about their identity. In other words, the song from the spirit gives the person an understanding of his own humanity. Therefore, the vision quest for the Dunzaza tribe is to receive knowledge of their identity, which is only given by an animal spirit that visits the vision seeker. In a similar fashion to the Dunaza tribe, members of the Ojibwa tribe take the vision quest journey when they are young. The Ojibwa tribe, like the Dunaza, seek a spirit that would provide them with important knowledge and guidance. As Sam D. Jill, a scholar of religious studies in Native American states, in the Great Lakes area, Ojibwa culture, it was their practice to begin early in a child's life to prepare him or her for a vision fast. The parents implored their children to engage in short fast to prepare them for receiving the power of Manido, of a spiritual being. 
By age eight, a child might fast two meals every other day while religious awareness to the visionary experience was certainly momentous. It was not attained without much training and preparation during the years of scheduled fasting. The child was made to think constantly about the power and guidance that he or she would receive in the vision. Now, what Gil mentions, right, Gil mentions the children of the Ojibwe tribe will take this journey of fasting to obtain a vision. The importance of this vision or dream is so that they can know which Manito, which is a spiritual being, would assist them in the journey in life. The Manito will provide the individual with the necessary knowledge, protection, and advice they should take. However, one's vision does not only provide what Manito they have, but the vision also shows that power the, individ the power the individual has gained. In other words, such a vision or dream will provide them with important existential information such as the way the individual has to live, what direction they ought to follow, and the powers they have gained. Therefore, for the Ojibwa visions or dreams, uh, therefore for the Ojibwa visions or dreams are extremely important since they provide the individual with the reality and knowledge of the identity in the world. Now, since dreams are an essential component in Native American everyday living, the communities have shared and passed down legends that show the effectiveness of dreams. One example of a legend regarding dream is from the Pawnee tribe, which insists that dreams provide the individual with knowledge and guidance. The Pawnee legend, the medicine, which is called the medicine grizzly bear, illustrates an individual receiving strength and power of a bear and gets guidance from a bear spirit through a dream. The specific guidance that the bear spirit gave was not to marry the chief's daughter since it would cause the individual to lose the power that was given to him. The information given to them, the, the, the information given to the individual was an introduction or instruction, sorry, informing the individual about what they should do concerning a problem they wish to avoid. The Seneca tribe also has a similar perspective on dreams. According to the Seneca tribe legend, the woman who fell, uh, which is called the woman who fell from the sky, uh, it illustrates a chief receives um, a chief receiving guidance regarding his sick daughter. Every re remedy of medicine had been given to her, but none were enough to make her well. A friend of the chief had a dream where he was instructed to tell the chief to place his daughter beside a tree so she could be cured. The chief followed the guidance of his friend's dream. Um, and the, the examples of the Pawnee and the Seneca legends demonstrate that it is through dreams that spirits communicate to individuals, directing and giving them information that instructs how they should act when confronted with a particular problem. For instance, uh, the daughter with uh, that was sick, um, and because of the dream, they are now uh, now she feels better. Now, Cajete provides a legend shared by many Native American communities that illustrates why dreams or visions are essential. The legend maintains that humans had at one time the ability to speak to animals, but communication between between them was terminated due to human malevolence towards the animals. In spite of this loss, however, humans and animals can still communicate with each other through, dream, through dreams and visions. Cajete describes it this way. I quote, in the beginning of time, native myth contends that the humans and, and animals could communicate with each other. Animals cared for humans, helping them find food, water, and shelter. They even sacrificed themselves when needed to help humans survive. They would assist humans in knowing when to prepare for the change of seasons or the coming of storms. This intimacy of animals came to an end when humans began to be disrespectful to the animals' relations. Humans, it is mythically related, began to abuse animals, kill them without need, steal the food they have stored for winter, and arrogantly mistreat them in various ways. In some native myths, such as those of the southern tribes, it is said that the animals had grand council meeting in which it was decided to punish humans by leaving them to fend for themselves and by refusing to communicate with them through language. This early direct connection to animals thereafter became submerged and can only be evoked through ritual dream and visioning. Now, although this passage claims one can only communicate with animals through dreams or visions, the legend also mentions that animals used to provide humans with enormous amount of assistance. Thus, if one notices carefully what this passage says, it mentions that before the mass of humans, the animals protected and directed the individual by informing them 
In other words, the animals help humans by giving them information on how to obtain food, where the individual should go, or what the person should do. But unfortunately, all this information is not difficult to obtain since we no longer have such communication with animals. For this reason, in order to receive direction or protection from animals, one needs to dream or have a vision. Now, um, there are other uh, American um, dream vision and stories of American tribes. Um, um, so along with the Dunaza tribe and the Ojibwa, the Pawnee and the Seneca tribes, other tribes also have a take on dreams. The Sunni people are sure that dreams have information about real events. In addition, the Huron tribe believes dreams have the same value of existence as someone being awake. In other words, dreams for the Huron tribe are an extension of the world where it has its comparative reality of the world where people are awake. This take on dreams is similar to the Dunaza tribe since they believe that weight walking and dreaming are both part of the same life story. The Menomini tribe, or the, on the other hand, takes dream a bit further and says that it not only has reality, but it provides prophecy and warnings. For instance, um, it, it will, for instance, um, I quote, for the Mesomini of the Great Lakes region, all dreams had a significance and the prophecies or warnings that dreams might contain were to be observed scrupulously. <clears throat> for example, if a man dream of drowning, he will make a small canoeing as a talisman and carry it about with him at all times. If the meaning of a dream was unclear, a person sought the interpretation of an elder who will be near the end of his life, her life was believed to be closer to the world or of the sp spirits. Every dream for the men mental meaning has significance and meaning in the real world. And thus one should take precautions on what to do if they receive a warning and dream. In similar fashion, the Nocinho takes dreams to be symbolic where dreams can mean danger or good fortune. For example, in the Nozinho tradition, if one dreams about hawks, elks, or thunder, it will symbolize good luck or good fortune. This interpretation of the symbolism in dreams is similar to the Cherokee, since the Cherokee legend illustrates that someone dreaming of an eagle or its feather symbolizes that one should do an eagle dance. In addition, the Mojave, or the Mojave and the Kokopawa and the Mirocopa tribes incorporate dreams to speak to their ancestors so they can receive direction from them. Overall, many Native American tribes depend on information they receive in dreams because such information directs them in decision-making. Although, although many Native American dreams have reality and provide informa important information to the individual, some dreams can be false. For this reason, the next section will discuss how Natives can still trust dreams, even as some dreams can give false information. So now we will be uh, in this section, uh, a short section, we will talk we will be talking about verifying dreams if the, the dream information is true or false. Now the Cree tribe has a legend called the Mujikiwis, which gives a story of a father-in-law who thought his dream was true but then realized that the dream was indeed false. The story illustrated this way, I quote, so he told all the people to go on, to go and get fish and eat them freely. On the following day, the young man, according to his mother-in-law's wish, took his wife to fish. They took many fish and carried them home. The father-in-law knew before they returned that they had caught many. The old man had a dream. When he saw how the young, when he saw how the youth prepared the spear, which his daughter had given him, he said, referring to his dream, my dream was wrong. I thought the youngest of the 10 liked me the best. I made the spear in the way I saw it, not as this one has shown me. It is due to my dream that it was wrong. Now, as shown in the story, the father-in-law had a dream where it, gave him, where it gave him false information. And such information did not have its truthfulness in the real world. For a dream to be considered true, then it must be consistent with other facts in the world of reality. In the father-in-law's case, his dream was not true, since in reality, the youngest of the ten did not like him the best, and he made the wrong spear. Therefore, even though dreams are important, some can be false. Although dreams have the potential to mislead, there are ways to test for a dream's veracity. An example of this can be found in the Huron tradition, where dreams are confirmed by events in the real world. 
Larry J. Zimmerman, an anthropologist and a scholar of Native American culture, when speaking of the Huron tribe states, I quote, the Huron paid particular attention to any dreams that occurred just before they went hunting, fishing, trading, or to war. So much did they rely on dreams for guidance in everyday life that the first Jesuit priest to contact the Huron described the dream as the tribe's people main god. Sometimes advice received in dreams followed in preference to advice given by the tribal chiefs. However, not all dreams were assumed to be reliable. Public confidence in an individual's dream varied according to his or her social status and how many of that person's earlier dream predictions have come true. As Zimmerman mentioned, the Huron tribe, like all other Native American tribes, is dream-driven. But dreams are counted as true when the dreams reveal themselves as true in the real world. In other words, although dreams are essential for Native people, dreams must show their trueness and reality. The more the individual's dreams are verified in the real world, the more they will be respected among the community. In conclusion, dreams for Native Americans are a source of epistemology and a way to obtain one's identity. For this reason, Native Americans would take dreams or visions seriously since they could provide important information. Such information received through dreams can provide an individual with a power that a spirit has bestowed on them or a direction one should take in their life. Additionally, dreams can, be me dreams can mean misfortune, prophecy, luck, or even have symbolic meaning. Also, sometimes information in dreams can be false, but in order to verify its trueness, the dreams need to be confirmed in reality. Generally, generally speaking, Native Americans learn and know things about the real world because of the information they gathered in the world of dreams. Therefore, dreams are an essential component in Native American everyday living. Um, thank you. That's the end. Thank you, Joel. Uh, let me... So, uh, is there any question to Joel? To some of you guys. No, Pedro, Alguma? Oh. Okay, Howard. Um, so, just uh, thanks for the intro. Very interesting topic. I mean, um, I'm kind of from a, more of an Asian culture, so. Uh, this is kind of very new to me, and um, if I say something stupid, please do uh, inform me, enlighten me. <laughs> yeah, and um, I kind of just curious about um, how, I mean, I mean, as the, I mean, I kind of like my line of thought more like from a traditional way of uh, uh, people doing uh, epistemology, say uh, from day guard, is seemingly they would they would regard, say, a dream as something that is uh, inaccurate, or at least if there's a possibility of a dreaming, then seemingly there's a possibility, more possibility of error. And and um, from your perspective, so, so here's my question. So from your perspective, how would you think, say, uh, say thinking about the kind of Cartesian a kind of skepticism? say it's kind of all wrong or or actually like uh like uh partially wrong say like maybe dream are still going to be valuable how would it uh be put it in the position with the cartesian kind of dream like skepticism here's my question uh, thank you howard for that question and it's funny how you mentioned the car because uh, uh the purpose of this paper eventually is to compare it to the car and uh, how um how it's it's similar, but then it's not. Um, Descartes, on the other hand, he says you cannot trust your senses because um, one one example he will say the dreams. Um, he's not really against dreams. If you read uh, his other works, he's just saying the main argument of Descartes is to go against the senses um, and why we can't trust it. Um, but we can we can trust our our mind, our rational thoughts. Um, Native Americans is is difficult to pinpoint um, what exactly they they say about um, reason, 
because uh, a lot of, a lot of what they say is through stories. Uh, so you kind of have to pinpoint what exactly um, they're saying in those stories. Um, however, um, if if for some reason an Native American were to talk to to Descartes, right, in some world, right, in the spiritual world, whatever you call it, um, how would they how would they interact and talk to each other? Well, um, the Native would probably say that um, um, you can. The only way you can verify the dream is if the dream is is actualized in the real world. But a Cartesian will say, "Well, how can you even trust that? Because your sense, you can't trust your senses. You have to like kind of go with your mind and reason." So, um, overall, the Native American will just probably uh, uh, these particular tribes will probably just say that it is uh, through the verifying these experiences in the world. Um, but at, Cartesians are not, are not really um, they don't they wouldn't like that explanation at all um i don't think they i don't think natives will have a response so far as to what i've seen um does that make sense yeah yeah now i have a, a question for joel actually uh one is not precisely a question it's more of a let's say a personal a share personal experience but uh, well, this is actually not only a personal experience. Uh, there's a famous mathematician, Ramanujan. You guys probably have heard of him. And he used to, to dream about theorems. And, well, of course, when he woke up, he, he would have to, uh, to, to prove the theorems he dreamt about. And it seems to me, uh, I found out uh, in my own personal experience and uh, dealing with other mathematicians, that this is actually very common. I had dreamt a lot about math, mostly because, well, I go to sleep thinking about math. So when I wake up, sometimes I have uh, thoughts, of which some, most of the time I'm simply continuing the thoughts I had in the, the evening after, but the evening before. But, well, sometimes I come up with new ideas upon waking up. And, and they come more or less like those uh, woke dreams. It's like uh, very realistic dreams because you're basically you're waking up. So you confuse dream with reality and things come together. But it seems that when you are kind of uh, relaxed in a relaxed state, sometimes new ideas come up to your mind. Most of them are bogus ideas, but not all. Sometimes they are actually functional ideas. Uh, for whatever neurological reasons from a scientific point of view this idea of uh, dreams having some epistemological values seems to have well experience shows that well maybe you can't really trust dreams but uh, you should give them some thought you should give them some consideration at least in, in these particular cases in which, well, what you dream about is something that's only on your mind. It doesn't, it doesn't make any reference to the external world in Cartesian terms. So I guess dreams are perhaps not reliable, but uh, they, they do seem to hint at relevant ideas sometimes. Yeah, well, yeah um, that's, that's definitely what Nader Reagan would say. Um, um, but it, there is a part in, in Descartes' work that he says that he got some of his ideas from dreams. Um, it's not from the meditation, but it's in other works of his. Um, yeah. So um, it's interesting. Um, yeah, but this, um, this seems to be a very universal, uh, I mean, universal in the sense I, I don't know any, psych any psychologist has uh, tried this experimentally, but it seems uh, there's a lot of uh, accounts of this kind of event. In, through literature, mathematical literature, this is very common. Mathematicians talk about this uh, in personal experience. I've experienced this, so this is kind of interesting. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. I'll definitely um, look more into that, uh, mathematicians and dreams. Um, yeah, I think you should. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> a very, yeah, I mean, if you were talking about Descartes and the idea of having ideas through dreams, you, maybe you should. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Check this um, out. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Thank you. And, and the question, I, the actual question I'd like, to, I'd like to pose to you is, well, 
sadly you weren't here for my presentation, but uh, I've talked about the idea of personal identity. And this seems to me to have something to do in a sense with, uh, I couldn't go into these details particularly during the presentation, but this seems to me to have something to do with uh, the idea of a, a coherent narrative. Okay. Uh, I mean, the idea of who, who is your true self, this is what I have discussed. And this, in a sense, has something to do with uh, how uh, I describe this in terms of how your values value throughout life. So you have a problem of, well, how you point out who is your true self, given that your values vary throughout life. And you should describe your true self in terms of values, given the, the psychological literature. Well, I can't go into the details now, sadly. But the point is, well, this has something to do with uh, some kind of idea of narrative coherence. In the sense that, uh, well, what I have uh, pointed out as being how you should go about answering the question of the true self, uh, is in terms of what would be the best explanation uh, about, well, who you have been throughout your life, basically. So I think Native American seems to have a lot to say about this idea of uh, narrative. I mean, those more, uh, let's say, more traditional epistemologies, not only Native American, but they seem to have the idea of narrative as core to, to how they deal with the world more generally, not only Native Americans, but it seems to me that uh, Australia uh, natives are also have some kind of uh, epistemologies of this kind. So this idea of narrative seems relevant to epistemology in a more traditional sense. So I'd like to hear what you have to say about this, this point. Yeah. Um, so in relation to identity um, uh, and um, they always use uh, stories, um, and one's um, one's experience also becomes a story. Um, but overall, um, through the person's journey, um, they they realize they realize certain things that they um, that correlates to the dreams um, that they had. Um, and, oh, and that and that shows them. Oh, well, that means that I'm this. Uh, it confirms. Um, they they have a. a Usually, uh, there's a symbolism. Like they have an artifact. They they are given an artifact, right? And the artifact, um, for example, let's say I, I get an arrow, right? The arrow represents uh, me as a warrior, um, um, and I have to find in my experience that confirmation that I am a warrior. So if I were to find a, 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 a if I if I come across an experience in which uh, uh, let's say a, a rock that shows an arrow, right? Um, that confirms that, oh yes, I am a warrior. I, I am I am this, this is who I am. Um, so, but you know, th this also correlates to free will a little bit because one can go against what the spirits of the, of, of the dreams, right? Uh, if they tell you you're this, right? You're a warrior. You can possibly say, oh no, I don't want to be. And then misfortunes happen. like. So overall, your identity, right, correlating to what you're saying about identity, it, it, uh, you get your identity through um, this um, dream world, and you confirm your identity through experience. Um, and then through that, you, you, uh, you, your, um, you use, um, you become like a story in itself, um, showing that I, I myself have gotten an identity through this. Um, and I hope that correlates to what you're saying when you're saying uh, narrative. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the point is precisely this. Uh, the point of, in part, the point of my work is uh, to, to ask this, this question. How do you, uh, how do you provide uh, an evidence-based uh, account of personal identity? Because, well, it seems uh, in folk psychology, uh, people tend to think of, the true selves, their true selves, as sometimes completely disconnected from evidence, in the sense that, well, experiments show that they will uh, ascribe uh, good moral qualities, even in, uh, to people who have shown known, 
good moral qualities in their lives, like psychopaths and things like this. So right. they will ascribe good moral qualities contrary to evidence. So how do you, in a sense, uh, rationalize this, this process of uh, uh, ascribing a true self to someone? It should, in some sense, uh, respond to evidence. And it seems to me that, well, these narratives, uh, theories uh, about personal identity, which are seem to me they are quite common in native epistemologies, they actually have some idea of how to deal with evidence in this context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, if you don't have any dreams um, or any, any confirmation, you're looked down upon. Uh, so, because it, it, it gives you who, who you are as a person, um, in, in that type of culture. And if you're not getting that, then you're not really, you're lost. Um, so it, it's, uh, dreams or visions are extremely important when it comes to a person identity, um, and overall why they exist and what they should be doing in their life, what powers they have, they have obtained, uh, uh, what are their symbols, uh, what they should seek in the world and guidance overall. So yeah, all of that. Of Sorry. What you have said, uh, it seems to me that, uh, well, during your presentation, it seems to me that, well, dreams tend to to have something to do with personal identity, precisely. The examples you have mentioned have to do with personal identity. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I'm asking. It seems that uh, there's a, a relevant uh, aspect of dreams uh, in this sense. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 uh, that's one of the things, the majority uh, of, of the points of dreams is the person identity and what it should be doing in life. But, um, yeah, it's totally in connection to uh, what you've um, been saying. Yeah. yeah. It, it said you couldn't be here. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't. Um, okay. Yeah. Any other questions or. Uh, just... well, there's... Oh, okay. I mean, just just a kind of like an echo with uh, Pedro's example with the mathematician, real quick. So, um, so Pedro's uh, example about like dreaming and inspiring about the theorem remind me about. So, in chemistry, um, I think uh, I think the the chemist is called Kakula. So he actually uh, dream about a snake uh, eating its own tail, and then he kind of inspire him to eventually discover say the the structure of benzene so i feel like actually maybe maybe like uh, there's some example in science about it's a, about say dream as an inspiration or or maybe work in some context of, of discovery yeah just like some random thoughts i'll definitely consider mind. the science aspect that would be amazing to be honest uh, to correlate it correlate the two uh, and, and and like you mentioned, Pedro, um, about uh, uh, mathematicians as well. Um, so it, it will be nice to like correlate, correlate it and, and connect all of that together. Um, yeah, it's a future project, I guess. <laughs> thank, um, you. But thank you, guys. Guys, uh, is something else? I'd like to ask you if well, I, it seems it doesn't. We don't have any questions from the audience. It would be nice to have yes. questions. From the audience, yes, yes, sure. We we have ten more minutes, so if we, oh, we can. Well, because we keep talking, so maybe people they don't want to interrupt, so they don't ask. But we'd very much like, I guess, to have <laughs> questions from the audience. Mm. If there is an audience, uh, we, we can't know for sure from oh, you this. Can't, you can't tell. There is no... <laughs> we can tell. <laughs> uh, maybe this is a dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I don't see any questions from yeah. the chat. No, no, from the chat, it's, not, it's no question. So if you okay. guys have Do some. You have one? Someone is. <laughs> Actually, no. <laughs> I, I'm I'm here learning with you. Oh, okay. 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 So maybe I'd have a question to you. Actually, uh, you haven't, I guess, presented yourself. So I'd like to know what you 
you are studying. And... Okay. <laughs> My research yeah, I mean, is in Sander. I'm here from UNIFESP. But I do my research in Simone de Beauvoir, so it's French oh, okay. philosophy. And yeah, it's gender and human rights. Actually, I'm from law school, so now I'm doing oh, no. research in philosophy, but I'm from law school. Nice. Oh, okay, so I, I'm actually from a law background also. Really? Yeah, I've come from from law, then I went to philosophy, and then I ended up in studying logic in Munich. Wow. And my my main work, this is a, a second line of work, actually. I'm trying to expand to, to field, but my main line of work is in liberalism, actually. Oh, I'm, interesting. Yeah, well, you can keep in there's, talk, a, oh, there's a lot of uh, yeah social choice theory uh, applications to to descriptions of uh, uh, right systems and things like that, and this is what I actually oh, do right. in my PhD. This is a second line of work what I have presented here. Nice. Well, I will do my presentation tomorrow morning in a okay. English roundtable actually. So if you guys. Are interesting okay. to hear. <laughs> nice. nice. It's a pleasure to meet you. And it's actually very nice that you guys bring your works to to present to us. And we are happy that you're here. And is there anything else you guys want to say? Or we can go to the well, end. I, well, I mean, I'd very much enjoy talking to you guys the whole nice. afternoon. It's a great time. Yes, people have things to do, so... <laughs> it was a great but time, that's that true. Mean, yeah, I don't know if you guys have... Well, I've uh, exchanged emails with Howard, but if you guys yeah. want to... Let's do, let's do the thing, Paul, uh, Pedro. Uh, I will finish here in YouTube, and um, and then we can talk later, okay? okay. Just a minute. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, I mean, I'll write so my email. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I want to thank you. I will finish this in Portuguese for people. So just a okay. minute, I come back. Uh, quero agradecer então a presença de todo mundo aqui. Agradecer mais uma vez a, a nossa equipe organizadora, a nossa equipe técnica também. Uh, o canal que está uh, o canal que está uh, ajudando a gente aqui colocando a gente online então por favor sigam curtam os vídeos uh, e é isso a gente continua com nossa programação à tarde amanhã também o dia todo e na quinta-feira a gente finaliza com as mesas presenciais com convidados especiais lá no Unifesp então quero lembrar vocês para participar para estar com a gente e é isso muito obrigada e até a próxima.